In the previous episode, the evolution and history of fighter planes ended around 1970. Since the Americans were leading the way in fighter development, it is appropriate to begin with them in the second part of the series. In the United States, starting from the 70s, fighter jets had to be multi-role regardless of their size and weight. They had to fit into a classic fighter role and at least a non-precision strike role. They also had to be able to perform close air support with certain limitations. In other words, they were still only expected to carry out strike tasks under good weather conditions. It was not deemed necessary that they have the same strike capabilities that the best fighter bombers had especially not taking into account the nighttime precision strike capability and range. Fighter jets based on this concept appeared in the 70s. This was a continuation of the trend that came with the F4 Phantom. But with new generation radars, engines and avionics, the results were very different. The first representative of the new generation of multi row fighters was the F-14 Tomcat. The development of the new fighter started in the late 60s, entered in service in 1974 for the US Navy, following a very long development. Originally, the F-111B was planned for the same role as that went for the F-14, but for many good reasons the project was cancelled. Within a decade, three more new fighter types followed the Tomcat. First the F-15 Eagle, then the F-16 Fighting Falcon for the US Air Force, which is interestingly mostly called Viper by almost everybody, then finally again a new naval fighter, the F-18 Hornet. The experiences of the Vietnam War were taken as a basis for these fighters. The elimination of defiances of the F-4 and other planes was a fundamental goal. The requirements of the close maneuvering air combat, dogfight capabilities got very high priority because the Phantom had issues in that era. It has to be noted that during Vietnam, the Phantoms flew from hundreds of kilometers to the target area, regularly with a heavy strike loadout, then air combat would sometimes occur. The small mix simply did not have such capability, they literally were only pawn defense capable fighters. It was easy to see the problems with such a scenario. The mix simply did not have the burden nor the capabilities as the large American planes did. Regardless, there were considerably conceptual differences between the four new American fighter types. The results were very different regarding size, weight and capabilities and of course, especially, their price was different. The Tomcat was by far the most expensive multi-row fighter of its time. It had to be suitable as a fleet air defense fighter with a long patrol time, but it was also expected to be effective as a classic fighter in the air superiority role. Filling the role of a good weather strike plane was just a rounding error on the list of specifications. Oh, and one small addition, the plane had to be carrier based. For the first role, the Tomcat had to be able to carry the half-ton active rudder guided long-range AM-54 Phoenix air-to-air missiles, at least four, but it could have been as many as six. Let's discuss the parameters of the missile. Half a ton per missile. For comparison, the AIM-9 Simander was barely 80 kg, even the AIM-7F Sparrow was only 230 kg, with a much smaller diameter, therefore less drag. With the huge missile, the F-14 had to achieve 2 hours of loiter time up to 250 km from the aircraft carrier group between two area refueling. This was necessary in order to able to shut down the approaching Soviet anti-ship missile carrier bombers in time or the launching missiles. The long petrol time required large fuel capacity, which already meant a large and heavy fighter. To ensure the necessary thrust for dogfight capability, a high performance, expensive engine was needed. Oh, and not one, but two engines. These expectations alone predicted a very expensive fighter. The F-14, which was born eventually, had an empty weight of merely 18 tons. For comparison, the F-14 was 7 times heavier than the F-4F Wildcat fighter from the mid-period of the Second World War, and about 9 times heavier than the F-28 Buffalo. Well, if this doesn't demonstrate the insane pace of fighter development, then I don't know what it does. Even compared to its predecessor, the F-4 Phantom, the Tomcat became so heavy and expensive that it made many people wonder when and where this trend would ever stop. 
because this ever-increasing spiral had a serious impact on the price. The unit of flyaway cost of the early series Tomcats produced in the early 70s was around 20 million dollars. Adjusted for inflation, this is somewhere around 100 million per planes by today's value. For comparison, the F-35A has less than 80 million dollar price tag for the Air Force today and the naval F-35C variant is only slightly more expensive. While the capability difference between the old F-14 and the S-35s will be obvious at the end of the series. Because of the insane price of the plane and limited availability, the US Navy never utilized the strike capability of the A and B Tomcat variants. Most people categorized the F-14 as a single row fighter plane while it had the necessary hardware to have strike capability. The loadout requirements of the large Phoenix missiles and the long loiter time demand meant that such a large plane could carry the strike loadout. Supporting a considerable amount of bomb load, the size of the plane was already adequate due its primary role as a fleet defense fighter thanks to the large AM-54 missile. Under the fuselage was possible to carry 4 900 kg or 8 450 kg or 14 227 kg bombs, which is not surprising feat from an 80 ton plane. The weight and cost of the required electronics might have hurt in hindsight. The resources devoted for the strike role were never utilized. The F-14 had a very sweeping design according to the trend of its era, which had a significant negative impact on the weight of the airframe. However, with an aircraft of such a weight, it was not possible to achieve the demanded low landing speed, while the Tomcat could fly faster than the twice the speed of sound at a very high altitude. The different wing sweep settings made it possible to optimize lift, drag and wave drag in different flight situations. The F-14 was a backup design instead of the F-111B, which also had variable wing sweep design, but the requirements were changed in numerous areas to achieve a far more suitable plane for a dogfight and their compatibility. Thanks to these changes, it was possible to achieve a roughly 18-ton plane instead of 21 plus ton F-111B. In air superiority, sweep and escort missions, the Tomcat would fly mostly with AIM-7 Sparrow and AIM-9 Cybunder missiles, but even with this less heavy and draggy loadout, the A variant had issues in a dogfight. The initially defined goals were only partially achieved with the F-14A. One of the key factors regarding the performance and fly safety was the TF-13 engine. Originally, a new engine was designed for the Cat. That was the 401 PW400, a slightly altered version of the F100, which was designed for the F15. Because of financial restrictions and anticipated risk, Leadership cancelled the engine project. The TS30 was selected, which was already in use by the F111 family. The thrust of the TS30 was more or less suitable for the air superiority fighter role, but the stability of the engine was the real problem. It was very sensitive to simultaneous angle of attack and engine power change, many times causing engine stall or deep stall. Because of this very unpleasant behavior, the Tomcat provided less advantage compared to the F4 Phantom as was expected, especially if we consider the very high price tag of the new fighter. This failure was corrected in 1987 by the F14A Plus version, in 1991 it was redesignated to F14B. The upgrade that Tomcat got the General Electric F110 engine with about 15% higher full afterburner thrust, while the full authority digital control supported engine provided the necessary stability. The F14 was the first fighter equipped with turbofan engine with afterburner stage. The F14 took first place in other areas as well, but I will return to this later when the avionics and weaponry will be presented. A few words about the new engine. The essence of the turbofan engine design is that the whole airstream does not pass through all the compressor and turbine stages. The engine has a low pressure and a high pressure stage, the latter is called the engine core. A part of the intake air bypasses the engine core following the low pressure compressor stages. The other part is compressed into the combustion chamber. With this design, better specific consumption can be achieved in subsonic speed range compared to turbojet engines, but it is less optimal in the supersonic speed region. According to the experience of the Vietnam War, most air combat happened in the low supersonic but rather high subsonic speed range. 
which eventually, following altitude and speed loss because of maneuvers, could be even slower subsonic. For this reason, the properties of the turbofan were acceptable in exchange for the considerably longer emission radius and longer loiter time. The enormous thrust required in maneuvering air combat was supported by the afterburner stage, just as for turbojet engines. Interestingly, this enormous power surplus made it possible to achieve Mach 2 speed region for some fighter types, even though this was no longer a high priority. Regardless, the aerodynamic changes were not optimized for high speed crews, the brute force of the afterburner could do the job. Of course, this optimization had drawbacks, but this will be a topic for another time. It is interesting that the turbofan engine design didn't debut on fighters, but on the F-111 fighter bomber family. After the F-111, every American supersonic aircraft was equipped with a turbofan engine. In contrast, the use of the turbofan engines on Soviet aircraft happened approximately 10-15 years later. The Su-24 fighter bomber and the MiG-23 fighter family still were manufactured with turbojet engines in the 70s. The first Soviet multi-role fighters with turbofan engines were the MiG-29 and the Su-27. The MiG-31 also was designed with a turbofan engine, but it was a homeland air defense fighter, we can call it interceptor, and not an air superiority one. Now let's see how the Air Force envisioned the replacement of the F-4. The F-15 Eagle was intended to be the best fighter which simply dominates the sky compared to any fighter in service or what could be considered in medium time frame as a new Soviet threat. It got the highest priority to outlast the preceding F-4 in dogfight. Despite the obsession with dogfight performance held by many Air Force theoreticians, serious improvements in the BVR air combat capability were expected from the Eagle. A fundamental goal was to avoid the extreme weight and expense that befell the F-14. In contrast with the Navy, such a long-range capability what the AM-54 and the AWG-9 radar provided was not specified. In a dynamic environment, the large engagement envelope of the Phoenix could not have been utilized in air combat over land, especially because of ground clutter. Thanks to the smaller air-to-air -air missiles of the planned armament and the different avionics, the Eagle could be considerably lighter. Especially that the variably sweeping design was simply rejected with clever specification of the plane. Although the surface area of the F-15 is not small, its weight is far smaller compared to any Tomcat variant. This partially was achieved by brute force and not by clever design. Titanium was used extensively as a structural material. About 25-30% of airframe's weight was made using this very expensive material. Even compared to the F-14, a higher proportion of titanium was used. Eventually, the empty weight of the F-15A was only 12.5 tons, which was 1 ton lighter than its predecessor, the F-4 Phantom. The combination of the light airframe and the sheer power of the new Pratt & Whitney F-4 100 engine provided such flight performance to the F-15 that it stood the test of time. There was a significant difference between the F-14A and F-15A in maneuvering air combat performance in favor of the Eagle. While the previous generation of fighter jet had a not so bad chance against the first Tomcat in certain situations in close air combat, they did not have much of a chance against the Eagle. The F-15 was simply in a different league in terms of dogfight performance. The F-14 was used by the Air Force as a single row fighter, while the F-15A, B, C and D versions had good weather strike capability, contrary to popular belief. The not a pound for air to ground slogan was only a marketing thing or a concept of how the plane should be designed. The reality was different. The F-15A essentially had the bomb targeting modes of the A-7E Corsair, but the Eagle did not have terrain-following radar and autopilot for low-altitude strike missions. Of course, it had a much shorter range with heavy loadout for same reasons as the F-4 Phantom. The early service period of the F-15s was overshadowed by the problems with the F-100 engine, but overall the results was much closer to the expectations compared to the F-14A. The issues of the F-100 engine were solved by the FEDEC control as happened with the F-14A+, but the engine replacement was not necessary. 
incorporating the digital control of the engines were carried out during the major overhauls of the airframes. After the success of the F-15 concept, the lightweight fighter program was initiated. The winner of that was the YF-16 technology demonstrator. It was chosen over the YF-17. The F-16 was needed because no matter how fantastic the capabilities of the F-15 were, the Eagle became too expensive to rearm every F-4 squadron to the F-15. Although the F-15 was significantly cheaper than the Navy's very expensive Tomcat, no one called it cheap. Another reason was that, despite all the innovations of the F-15A, some theoreticians still did not believe that the higher kill probability could be achieved in beyond visual range combat. From their point of view, the BVR capability was just a fancy, expensive, but almost useless thing. The single engine F-16 was designed along this guiding principle. Some theoreticians thought that even the rudder is not necessary for a fighter. This extreme idea was discarded, but it is a good indication of the intention to fulfill the main priority. The goal was to build the lightest possible pin around the F-100 engine. This made the YF-16 very attractive when compared to the YF-17, which had a different, new engine and was a twin-engine plane. Regardless, the F-16 was designed as the ultimate dogfighter, it was still required that it have a strike capability, but as usual only good weather capability was specified. On the other hand, it was a setback, the Viper lagged beyond visual range capability, at least initially. Such experiments were carried out, there was a test launch with a Sparrow missile and even extra high points could have been created. This idea was cancelled, probably because of financial reasons. Until the early 90s, only the short-range AM9 Simander missile and gun comprised the air-to-air -air inventory of the F-16s. Some sources and journalists claimed this was a doctrinal decision, but I can only treat this as an euphemic statement. It was quite a questionable decision, considering the later designed Soviet MiG-29 fighter, which had beyond visual air combat capability. Compared to the F-15, the F-16 was much smaller, extremely compact single engine fighter, the dogfight capabilities got the outermost importance. Thanks to this approach, the ejection seat is tilted by 30 degrees, which makes it easier for the pilots to deal with G-forces during high overload maneuvers. Ejection seats tilted backward have been installed for other fighters just either, but they have never done it in a such extreme way. The F-16 became the queen of close maneuvering air combat, even slightly surpassing the F-15 in several aspects. At barely 7.5 tons, the F-16 had low drag airframe and the engine had extremely high thrust output. Ironically, despite the pursuit of superior dogfight air combat performance, the F-16 debuted and achieved its fame in a strike mission back in 1981. Israel destroyed the Asirak Iraqi nuclear power plant under construction near Baghdad with F-16A Block 1 planes, which were escorted by F-15s. See the link to the video about the operation in the description. In the case of the Viper, it can definitely be stated that it indeed possessed operational strike capabilities. Moreover, during almost its entire career, the F-16 flew mostly air-to-ground missions. It is quite amazing that a barely 7.5-ton plane realistically could carry a 3.5-ton loadout, which could be as more as 4.5 tons. This is not the total weight, the fuel and the weapons, as planes are promoted nowadays in marketing materials, this is the weight of the external stores. However, because of this, the chief engineer of the plane, Harry G. Hilliker, said in an interview that if he had known that this would happen frequently, he would have been designed the plane a little differently. From the four fighters mentioned in the introduction, one still has not been presented. The YF-17 Cobra did not disappear without a trace in the abyss of history. Eventually, it was redesigned in accordance with the needs of the Navy, which led to the birth of the F-18 Hornet. After the Air Force acquired two new fighter types, the Navy also had the need for a real affordable multi-role fighter. This fighter would replace the aging F-4 Phantom in the strike role and complemented the F-14 Tomcat in air superiority role suitable for maneuvering air combat. The empty weight of the Hornet, like the F-15, was relatively modest, around 11 tons. The continuous increase of the weight and the cost of the planes beyond all limits was somewhat prevented. 
Not only a more logical mindset and specification aided this, but the general technological advancement since the birth of the F-15 did as well. The technology available during the design of the Hornet was considerably different from the era of the F-14. Meanwhile, millions of hours of experience have also been accumulated with turbofan engines. Contrary to stereotypes, the F-14 Tomcat was not a top-tier dogfighter plane of its era. The Navy still needed a real multi-role fighter that was relatively cheap. The basic requirement did not change, this new fighter had to be able to perform well in maneuvering air combat, while the beyond visual range air combat capability was also requested, as well as air-to-ground strike capability. However, as for the F-15, only Sparrow and Sivander missiles comprised the air-to-air -air armament, in addition the M61 Vulcan gun. The F-14s took care of the fleet defense role with the Phoenix missile. In terms of flight performance, the Hornet lagged behind the Air Force F-15 and F-16 fighters. The focus was on medium and low-speed high angle of attack maneuvers and high instantaneous turn and pitch rates. In this area, it actually surpassed the two Air Force types. Overall, the Hornet's flight performance and price-value ratio were adequate. The interesting thing about the Hornet is, it had a unique engine. The F-404 was not used in any other American supersonic fighter, in contrast to the GE F-110 and Pratt & Whitney F-100 engine families. Let's see what characterized the avionics, armament and cockpit design on American fighters just from early 70s. This will be the benchmark for the future. The cockpit of the F-14A, F-15A and F-16A were still in a transitional phase compared to the mid-late 80s version of these families. On the F-14A only the rudder intercept officer had a large display. This was necessary to ensure the effective use of simultaneous engagement capability of the AWG-9 radar and the AM-54 missile. The management of the task could not be solved in any other way. In contrast, there was only a smaller display in front of the pilot, on which the rudder situation picture was repeated. On the other display, only basic flight information and operating modes were displayed. The age of the multifunction displays had not yet come. The displays were cathode ray tube TV screens. Compared to the early 60s, the instruments were arranged and grouped more logically, maybe there were a little less switches and knobs, but it was still very much the age of electromechanical displays. The F-14 didn't even have a HUD, a very primitive HUD light display was projected on the front glass of the cockpit. It displayed few bits of information that even in the mid-70s it could not be considered as a real HUD. Even the F-14B version had the same design while all the other 4 generation planes had far more advanced real HUDs. The view from the cockpit was improved compared to the F-4 Phantom in accordance with the requirement of better maneuvering air combat capability. However, the Tomcat was not a big leap forward in this area either. The forward and forward to side view was more limited compared to the F-15, but especially compared to the F-16 due to the thick cockpit frames. In the F-14B version, the cabin was a little more advanced compared to the A model, but the contemporary American fighters clearly surpassed it. The view from the cockpit of the F-15 was better compared to the Tomcat. The cockpit frame blocked a much smaller area. The Eagle had a real HUD, but regardless of this, the cabin still resembles the late 60 planes. We could find lots of electromechanical instruments and switches in the pit. The only exception to this, the appearance of the control panel under the HUD. Later this type of placement and function became more and more common. On the left side of the HUD was the radar screen, on the right was the radar warning receiver display, also on TV screen. The cockpit of the F-16A Block 1 also showed some improvements, but the view is still very far from what we can see when looking into a cockpit of a fighter jet today or just the late 60s in general. The display on the left was extremely primitive. It displayed only some text information similar to watches with digital character displays. The display of the rudder warning receiver is above that. The display screen for the rudder is positioned between the pilot's legs. The F-16, like the F-15, already had a real HUD. The F-18 has an instrument and display arrangement that can be considered typical for a fighter in the digital era. The electromechanical instruments were minimized, but they still had a considerable proportion of the cockpit. 
There are two multifunction displays on either side of the control panel under the HUD and one more under the integrated control panel. The Hornet in the early to mid 80s with three multifunction displays in the cockpit was anything but average. In fact, the Hornet very likely had the best human machine interface at the time. In the mid 80s, the F16 Black 25 version also had an integrated control panel and two MFDs. But the navigation and attitude indicating instruments interestingly remained electromechanical instead of using MFDs. Essentially, the cockpits of the fighter jets were designed from the early 80s until the second decade of 2000s carried the legacy of these two cockpits from the mid 80s. They are just further upgraded versions of the first ones. For the presented four US fighters, using the HOTAS, as known as hands on track and strict principle, was common for the controls. The most important combat functions could be controlled using buttons, switches, rotary switches, or sliders on the joystick side stick and the throttle. Using in combination with the head-up display, the pilot could focus his attention upon flying the aircraft, manipulating sensors and engaging targets rather than looking for the controls in the cockpit. Using any button on switch during high G overload turn would be impossible, therefore the HOTAS is essential. The lots of switches on the side panels of the cockpits can be misleading. For example, if we check the cockpit of the F-15 a or C, we can see many of them, but they are needed for the startup procedure and perform non-combat functions. Nowadays, many of these startup functions are integrated into MFDs and digital systems of the plane. The inertial navigation system at the dawn of the digital era were more accurate, the navigation was more automated even compared to the dedicated strike fighters like the F-111 family. In daytime, an F-16A fighter with a single crew was able to navigate to the target almost as precisely in time and space as the two-manned F-111 and could bomb the same or with even better accuracy thanks to the new bomb targeting modes. This was demonstrated in action, see the video about Operation Opera. After roughly flying 1000 km, essentially without any major reference points, the Falcons navigated to the target zone, then bombed with such an accuracy that almost every bomb hit the target from low altitude. A fighter weighing barely 7.5 tons with a single crew was capable of doing this. This was astonishing with the point of view of early 80s. The air-to-air -air armament of the new fighters still was the good old AM9 and AM7, but their new generation in the 70s were a big leap forward. The new AM9L was the first among the Sivanders with all aspect capability. It was possible to lock and launch in head or semi head aspect. This changed the basic nature of the dogfight. Until the appearance of the AM9 Lima, a head or just a side engagement was possible only with semi active rudder guided missiles. The Lima variant got a new engine, which dramatically increased its kinematic range over the previous generation. The AM7 Foxtrot variant also got a new engine design with dual thrust feature. This meant that the solid propellant rocket engine had a carefully designed timed thrust characteristics. Following a short rapid acceleration period, the engine ran on considerably lower thrust. It sustained the speed of the missile, while at medium-high altitude still slightly accelerating. Compared to its predecessor, the AIM-7A-2, depending on launch and target altitude, it increased the edge of the engagement envelope by 30-50%. A separate video will explain the main characteristics and features of air-to-air -air missiles. The active radar-guided AIM-54 Phoenix remained the unique missile of the F-14. No other plane ever could carry that. Until the arrival of the AIM-120 MRAM, it was the only missile in its category. The development of the AIM-120 suffered from many delays and only following the Cold War became operational. Missiles with active guidance guide themselves to the target in the terminal phase because they have their own small radars. In comparison, those with semi-active guidance, such as the AIM-7 Sparrow or the Soviet Air-23R on the MiG-23, demanded continuous target illumination from the launch platform. In addition, only one target could be engaged at a time with the semi-active guided missiles because of the limitation of the mechanically scanned radars. In contrast, simultaneous target engagement was possible with the AIM-54, 
even though the AWG-9 was a mechanically scanned radar. Conventional fighter jets, with the exception of the F-14, could attack only one target at a time until the arrival of the AIM-120 Abram. In order to utilize the 150-200 km maximum launch range of the Phoenix missile against high altitude incoming targets, the simultaneous target engagement capability was necessary. This required a digital, microprocessor-based computer and extremely powerful radar, which were unparalleled at the time. The simultaneous target tracking and engagement was necessary. If the F-14 had only one target channel, then after the first missile was guided, some of the targets could have flown past to the plane before the second missile could be launched or the third. Because of this, the AM-54 missile was designed with active radar guidance, making it the first in its category for a very long time. Anyway, the F-14A was the first aircraft equipped with a digital microprocessor-based computer. The radars of these fighters were finally able to track targets flying in ground clutter reliably, at least with reduced range. It made it possible to utilize the beyond visual range combat capability, even if the targets tried to escape with a quick dive. The radars were far more advanced compared to the 60s era, but they were not almighty sensors. In the 80s, most advanced airborne radar systems could discriminate targets in very close formation. The distance didn't matter. The radar displays for these fighters showed only digital target symbols. Such noise, which were visible on the displays of all the radars, simply were filtered out, as well as many types of jamming. The experience of the Vietnam conflict also meant a new era for self-defense. On third generation fighters, flare and chef dispensers became standard, as well as the radar warning receiver and electronic jamming equipment. The only exception from this rule was the F-16, which lacked the integrated electronic countermeasures because of its size, but it was possible to carry a jamming pod under the fuselage hardpoint. The radar warning receiver display was always close to the hard as possible, it got a very high priority. On the Hornet, the RWR could be displayed on the MFD. Also, thanks to Vietnam, the internal gun returned to the inventory. All of them were equipped with the M61 Vulcan 20mm Gatling gun. Interestingly, among the many F-4 variants, only the F-4E got the internal gun. Even the US Navy used the last F-4 variants until the mid-80s, they never received this conversion. On the contrary, the only Soviet frontline fighter without an internal gun was the MiG-21PF. The advance in strike weapons and capabilities were not equal among the planes. The F-14 could use only down bombs, but it never was utilized, therefore it made no sense to further upgrade this plane in this area. The F-15 was almost the same case. Even the F-15A could use the GBU-8 with special pod, the US Air Force never utilized the strike capability of the Eagle, therefore further upgrades were not carried out. The F-16A was not a universal plane as we know today. Besides dumb bombs and unguided rockets, the only precision-guided weapon of the Falcon were different versions of the AGM-65 Maverick. These have been presented briefly in our video about the A-10, the link is in the video description. On the F-16 Block 25 appeared the AGM-45 Shrike, even when it was under replacement by the AGM-88 Harm. In the strike role, the Hornet was the queen of the early 80s. Even the first A variant had precision strike capability with an air to ground missile or glide bomb. Namely, these were the AGM-65 family and the AGM-62 Walleye. Thanks to being a US Navy fighter, it was the platform of the AGM-84 Harpoon anti-ship missile. Finally, it was able to perform in seed roll against air defense systems thanks to the new anti-radiation missile of the 80s, the AGM-88 Harm. In the mid-80s, the digital revolution reached the engines. The transient operation issues of the F-100 engine were finally solved by the full automated digital control. The engine upgrades were carried out during the major overhauls for the F-15 and F-16. The F-14B almost became what the Tomcat was originally envisioned thanks to the GE F-110 engine, also with digital control. The FADEC finally made it possible for the pilots to freely move the throttle lever no matter the speed, the angler attack or the overload without worrying about the engine stall. 
from the four fighters, the first two had neutral, stable aerodynamic design, while the F-16 and Hornet were unstable planes. This concept enhanced the maneuverability of the planes in some areas, better pitch rate and instantaneous turn rate, but it demanded to use the fly-by-wire control and digital fire control system. The mechanical and hydromechanical fire control systems are relatively heavy and require careful routing of flight control cables through the aircraft by systems of pulleys, cranks, tension cables and hydraulic pipes. The appearance of the fly-by-wire started a new era. The fly-by-wire replaces the conventional manual flight controls of an aircraft with an electronic interface. The movements of flight controls are converted to the electronic signals transmitted by wire. Combined with a flight computer and digital flight control system, it makes it far easier to keep the plane in controlled flight, even in the most complicated maneuvers. As a bonus, the system is lighter. Before the fly-by-wire, control system had existed, but the quality and features, what the new conception and technology made possible, took things to a different level. It extended the safe flight envelope of the planes, thanks to the very fast response of the controls. Even on the edge of the controllability, average pilots could fly safely with the planes with far less concentration and workload. Interestingly, no matter how advanced the different F-15 variants were from the beginning, the first equipped with a fly-by-wire control system was only the F-15SA in the second decade of the 2000s. Now that is the time to check what meant the 70s from the early 80s on the other side of the Iron Curtain. In the very early years of the 70s, further development and manufacturing of the MiG-21 and MiG-23 families occurred. The last Fishburne variant was the BIS, it was produced from 1972 until the April of 1985. The MiG-21 had an insanely long production history, regardless it was outdated type even in the early 70s, no matter the many incremental upgrades. The first really mass-produced MiG-23 variant was the M. It was a domestic Soviet version, the export variant was the MF. The MiG-23 ML had a lighter airframe and was equipped with a more powerful engine. These upgrades made it possible to decrease the fuel loadout, while the plane had the same combat radius as the M and MF variants. To increase the dogfight performance of the plane, it got a new intermediate wing sweep position with 33 degrees. Thanks to these upgrades, the flight performance of the ML increased, but otherwise it had almost identical capabilities with the M and MF variants. Serious progress was made by the MLD version, which in some areas almost matched to the new MiG-29 or even surpassed it. The MLD airframes were not newly built, they were converted ML-01s. About 506 MLDs were converted, but they were not 100% uniform. For the last series of the MLD, the R-73 short-range infrared guided missiles was integrated, but without a helmet-mounted sight. The radar of the MLD provided almost the same capabilities that the MiG-29 had. In order to further enhance dogfight performance, on leading edge a new vortex generator was designed. The wolf tooth shape is clearly visible on the leading edge. Perhaps an even more important change was the automatic leading edge sled control. Flying with the intermediate 33 degree wing sweep, during high angle of attack maneuvers, the pilots could easily reach the limit of the wing stall. The automatic control and moving of the leading edge sled improved the controllability of the MiG when it flew on the edge. Despite all the efforts and development, thanks to the political lobbying, yes, this also existed in the socialist Soviet Union, the plane was the black sheep of the frontal aviation and the export market. The MLD version was barely exported outside the Soviet Union. While in the mid-80s about 25% of the planes of the frontal aviation were MiG-23 MLDs. Strange, isn't it? The grave of the MiG-23 was dug by its successor, the MiG-29, which was already in production in the same period. However, the next generation of the Soviet fighter planes are a topic for another time. If you like the video, you can share, like, subscribe or ring the bell and follow the channel. You can support it via Patreon for exchange early access videos, voting on planned topics and extra content is available as well regular updates about the projects.